Welcome to the first of three workshops for the Eliminate Projects fundraising campaign. And a special notice to you that each one of our three workshops will be different workshops. So I encourage you to attend all three while you're here at the convention. I'm really thrilled that all of you have come to learn more about the goals of the Eliminate Project and how you and your clubs can get involved. Today we're going to tell you about this cause and how together with our trusted partner UNICEF and our other MNT donor partners that we are going to change the world. I would like to now begin our workshop by introducing our first speaker, Dr. John Button. John began his service with the Kiwanis as a member of the Ridgetown District High School Key Club in the 10th grade just a couple of years ago. <laughs> he has since served the organization at nearly every level. Currently, John is a campaign vice chairman and is a trustee on the Kiwanis International Board and is a champion of causes that impact health and the well-being of children. It is really an honor and, and a great privilege for me to be able to serve with John on the campaign, and he has been of tremendous assistance and counsel to me since January. I am confident that in just a few short minutes, you will find his passion engaging. So I want you to help me to please welcome Dr. John Button. Good morning, Geneva. Thank you, Randy, for your kind introduction. I'd just like to point out to the audience that I'm prematurely gray and prematurely balding. <laughs> My name is John Button, and I am very grateful for the opportunity to share with you today the reasons why I'm here. Let me first introduce you to Bryn Matthews. Bryn was born on February 25th. 2011, weighing 3.42 kilograms, or 7 pounds and 2 ounces. By an accident of geography, she was born healthy, and her neonatal period was uneventful. She was born in St. Joseph's Hospital in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Her mother had been immunized against tetanus. The birthing room and instruments used were clean and sterile, as were the delivery techniques used by a highly skilled obstetrician and his delivery room attendants. I am so blessed. Bryn is my granddaughter. I'm happy to say that last Tuesday, weighing in at uh, 16 pounds even, she had her second tetanus shot. <clears throat> As I wind down my medical practice and look forward to retirement, I have been reflecting on uh, the past three decades of providing medical care in my community. And I've been struck by two things, my blessings and my disappointments. I have brought hundreds of babies into the world, and I am so blessed that I have never had to worry about maternal and newborn tetanus. My mothers have been immunized. The birthing rooms and practices were clean and sterile. And I must say, the obstetrician wasn't that bad either. <laughs> Several times over the years, though, I have been disappointed by new parents who deny their infants immunizations, including tetanus vaccine. I have seen the horrific pictures and videos of babies dying from tetanus, and I have to tell you that I consider this denial a form of child abuse. That millions of babies around the world are not protected from tetanus is no less. The U.S. Fund for Tetanus has called our success over iodine deficiency disorders one of the great public health achievements of the last century. Millions of children around the world now live lives of hope and promise. We Kiwanians 
have added billions of points to the world's collective IQ. We did change the course of history, and when we eliminate maternal and neonatal tetanus, we will have done it again. Every year, 8.1 million children under the age of five die of preventable illness. 41% of these deaths occur within the first 28 days of life. In many areas of the world, tetanus is one of the chief causes of these premature infant deaths. And although medicine has made great strides, we have made the least progress in maternal and neonatal health. There is no more joyful event in the life of a family than the birth of a child. In days, however, tetanus can turn those tears of joy in, into tears of anguish and grief. Tetanus is a cruel and swift killer. It kills one newborn baby every nine minutes, and one family becomes motherless every 20 minutes. Every year, 59,000 newborn babies are tragically killed by this preventable illness. 25,000 new mothers suffer the same fate. Tetanus is an infection caused by the bacteria Clostridium tetani. This bacteria is found in the soil, animal feces, and decaying matter all over the world. It is introduced into the body through wounds that occur during the birthing process. Once inside the body, the bacteria multiply and produce a toxin, a poison that specifically attacks the baby's nervous system, making it exquisitely sensitive to all external stimuli, sight, sound, and touch. Any stimulus can cause the baby to have excruciating, excruciatingly painful and prolonged seizures. In some cases, seizures that are so violent that they can tear muscles and break bones. Curative treatment is rarely successful because it is difficult, expensive, and in developing countries, wholly inadequate or just not there. In this situation, a hypersensitive nervous system, the kindest treatment is the saddest treatment, sensory deprivation. The baby's eyes are covered and cannot see the look of concern in a loving mother's eyes. Its ears are plugged and cannot hear the tender murmuring of a caring mother. And most tragically, the baby cannot be touched or cradled in the mother's loving arms. In most cases, the baby dies. This baby, so recently a hope of great promise and the embodiment of a family's hope for the future, dies a sad and pitiful death, a death that is recognized as one of the most excruciatingly painful deaths known to man. The baby dies in the dark, with the only thing it hears being its own heart-wrenching cries, and the only thing it feels, the pain of its seemingly endless seizures. The baby dies alone, and nobody should die alone. The baby, in most cases, was born in the dirt. It dies in the dirt and is buried in the dirt. Maternal neonatal tetanus is a women's rights issue. It is a marker of poverty and health care inequity. Its victims come from the poorest, most marginalized populations living in underserved and hard to reach areas. They live at the end of the road, if there is a road. They do not have access to clean and safe birthing facilities and practices due to poverty, poor hygiene, geographical constraints, illiteracy, and cultural practices and beliefs. In Sub-Saharan Africa, 59% of all births occur at home. In Asia, that number rises to 62%. It is a fundamental woman's right to be able to protect her unborn child and have access to clean and safe birthing facilities and practices. In many cases, this will require the abandonment of some traditional practices and beliefs. 
in areas where tetanus is endemic, the final act in the birthing process is often treating both stumps of the umbilical cord with cow dung. In the Sudan, neonatal tetanus is called the black bird disease because it is believed that the illness has been caused by a black bird roosting on the roof of the hut at the time of the baby's birth. The great tragedy, of course, is that maternal and neonatal tetanus need not happen at all. The UN calls this ongoing tragedy a silent scandal. We have had the tools to end this scandal for years. Researcher, researchers discovered the tetanus vaccine in 1897, and it has been widely available since 1924. With three shots, costing 60 cents a piece approximately, we can offer those in the developing world what we have taken for granted for decades. Previously, our newly immunized pregnant women will pass their immunity on to their newborns. This immunity will last for the first two months of life, after which government-mandated and UNICEF-supported immunization programs kick in and take over. If we could rid the world of Clostridium tetani bacteria, we could eradicate this tragic infection. But we can't eradicate dirt. We can, however, eliminate tetanus. Elimination means less than one case of tetanus per 1,000 live births in all districts of a country. The key to elimination is immunization and access to clean birthing practices supported by education. Once again, Kiwanis has partnered with UNICEF. We have history. This partnership has had an immense impact around the world. A memorandum of understanding defining this partnership was signed several weeks ago by representatives of Kiwanis International, the Kiwanis International Foundation, the U.S. Fund for UNICEF, and UNICEF. UNICEF does not go into a country unless they are invited. They have the feet on the ground and the organizational skills to carry out this massive immunization project. We Kiwanians are 600,000 strong, and we bring to the project our fundraising skills, but more importantly, we bring our commitment, our passion, and our enthusiasm for protecting and saving the lives of children. We Kiwanians are the final push. Here you see the range of maternal and neonatal tetanus in 2001. And here now is the range of maternal and neonatal tetanus in 2008. And I draw your attention to the changes in Africa, Asia Minor, and the Indian subcontinent. <clears throat> this will be the Kiwanis gift to the world. Our partnership with UNICEF is unbeatable. We already have momentum. Kiwanians reach people in communities, and UNICEF reaches those who live at the end of the road. The forgotten. What do we need to do? We need to raise $110 million to immunize and protect mothers and their future newborn babies. Maternal and neonatal tetanus is a silent scandal. The Eliminate Project is about protecting the world's most vulnerable at their most vulnerable time. We cannot rid the world of the tetanus bacteria. It is everywhere. But we Kiwanians can stop it from killing newborn babies and their mothers. And I know that we will. While you have been listening to me this morning, two more babies have died of tetanus. And one more family has lost a mother. Thank you. 
Thank you, John. I've now heard John give this presentation several times. And each time I find myself overwhelmed with emotion. Each time I actually hear something new that strikes me. And today what struck me was the women's rights issue and how our campaign is a women's rights issue and providing that basic right of a healthy birth and giving that mother and that baby an opportunity for a glorious future. Uh, when I stop to think about how easily we can prevent MNT, I become inspired all over again. And hearing your story, what you, you said that touched me is that there is a solution. And uh, I don't know if you can imagine, but if you can think about if we found a cure to cancer and didn't use it, <laughs> that's kind of an analogy of what, what, this, is, what this is about. Um, the theme of today's workshop is make it personal. And as you can see, John has done just that. He takes his personal story. In fact, I consider it a privilege I was part of that personal story because when Bryn was born, uh, to show you John's commitment, he was at his first training in the Eliminate campaign in our committee. Uh, and we all got to share that birth. And um, that, was, that was very special. So he takes his personal story and, it, and he folds in the facts uh, and the case and becomes an advocate for this campaign. And we'll talk more about how you can do that later. But now we want to introduce you to another advocate. Lenora Hanna actually had the opportunity a year ago to travel on a site visit to see our partner UNICEF first at hand and to see how the campaign works. Lenora is a member of the Lincoln Northwest Kiwanis Club uh, in Lincoln, Nebraska. And she's been a member of Kiwanis for 18 years. She is the past president of her club. And better yet, as typical, we all know, she has become the secretary of that club and has been serving in that capacity since the year 2000. It's funny how secretaries kind of just <laughs> stick with it. Um, no worries. <clears throat> she has twice been a lieutenant governor. She is uh, now retired from her career, but she has a new career now in Kiwanis. Uh, she serves as the district coordinator for the Eliminate campaign. Uh, she also is the district administrator for the Nebraska-Iowa Circle K, and uh, they have achieved a 65% growth in the last two years as she served as that administrator. Great job. So it shows that she takes campaigns and other things that she's involved in and applies that to membership growth, which we're all about as well. She is a mother of two children and has two, two stepchildren. She is married to Milford Hanna, who I'm sure some of you also know, and they together visited uh, in Philippines in 2010. And uh, we're so privileged to have Lenora share her story with us today as well. Lenora? Thank you, Randy. Like Randy's, is this on? You're on. Okay. Like Randy said, uh, Milford and I had the opportunity in June of 2010 to travel to the Philippines. And whenever I share my experiences about that trip, uh, three stories always uh, come to mind. I'm a mother, as he said, but I'm also a grandmother. Have seven uh, grandchildren and one great, great grandson. And uh, Milford's and my youngest child, uh, Andrew, is also here at the convention with us uh, this week. 
And I'll tell you, I cannot imagine um, a time when, when the children would have been sick that I would not have been able to uh, touch them. Mm -hmm. And tetanus, uh, as you heard uh, John say, causes babies to have extreme sensitivity to sight, sound, and touch. So a mother cannot comfort her child, and all of you people that are in here that are a mother or a father know that when your child is sick, that's what you want to do, and that's what they want. They want you to hold them. These babies cannot be touched at all. And I think this, as a mother, affected me the most. It's heartbreaking. I can't convey to you how my heart aches when I think about this. My children are precious to me, just like all your children are precious to you. For the women and the families that lose their children to tetanus, are living a life without their children, and it's a sad, and lonely reality for them. My first story that I would like to share with you takes place in a rural village two hours from Dumaguete. I got to meet and sit down and interview a mother who was going through the grief of losing a child, a child that she had just given birth to two months prior to our visit. Her story is a tragedy, and it was very hard for me to hear. The saddest thing about meeting her and hearing her story was knowing that her death was preventable. She had been approached about having the vaccinations, and when I asked her why she had not had the vaccinations, she did not see a reason to have them because she had two healthy children already. So I asked her, I said, well, will you have the vaccinations now? And she said, no, because I will never be able to have another child, meaning she was not choosing to have another child. And I said, well, sometimes unplanned pregnancies happen, and would you have the vaccinations at that time? And she said, yes. She said, yes, and then she said some words to me, I will never, ever get out of my mind. And that is, I've learned my lesson. No one should have to learn their lesson, no one rich or poor. The trouble is that the people in these developing countries are often forgotten. They often don't have the access to health care or the education to make informed decisions. And by the time they find out how easily they could have prevented their child's death, it's too late. <coughs> they don't know any better they are scared, and the vaccination process is unfamiliar to them. That's why it is so important for UNICEF to be there administering these shots. Through the Eliminate Project, we are going to raise 110 US million dollars to provide vaccines and education to the hard to reach populations of the world they will not continue to be forgotten. My second story is about two babies that I saw in a hospital in Manila. This baby boy and baby girl were suffering from tetanus. I saw firsthand the horrible suffering that these babies go through, the, the body arching seizures patches covering their eyes because of light sensitivity, the feeding tubes, lying 
They look so small lying in a big crib without anyone there to comfort them, dying without a mother's touch. But my experiences in the Philippines, although very life-changing for me, were not all sad. My third story is about a trip to a health clinic in Dumaguete. Here I met two first-time mothers who had had their vaccines prior to the delivery of their babies. But I had the most awesome experience of my life, and that was being in a delivery room and watching a mother give birth to her son. And anyone that was there, Kate was there, she knew I would just, I just bawled like a baby uh, after I came out of that delivery room. But this baby boy was very lucky because his mother had only had one vaccination. And she knew to have a healthy baby that she needed to go to a clinic where everything was sterile and she was there. And so she was going to have the remainder of her shots because one vaccination was not going to protect her or her baby uh, from tetanus. But when she had the other two vaccinations, this was going to give any future brothers or sisters a tetanus-free birth also. Just three shots just three shots, $1.80, along with invaluable education will keep this woman and others families whole. And that's what this project is all about, keeping families whole. Providing mothers the opportunity to birth healthy babies, touch them, comfort them, and to watch them grow. Through the Eliminate Project, we will protect the connection between mother and child and save and protect millions of lives. While my heart aches for those losses these mothers have experienced, I am comforted and very proud knowing that the Qantas family is going to do something about it. I went to the Philippines strictly as a Kwanian going on a site visit about MNT and not really knowing what it was all about. But I'm here to tell you that I left the Philippines and came back to the United States as a mother who just happens to be a Kwanian. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lenora. We truly are honored that you did come back and you chose to share those stories with us. I know how difficult it is to do that over and over again, but we, we definitely are better for it. And uh, thank you so much for your continued support and uh, for your passion for this campaign and also your commitment of hours that you continue to, to, to spend for it. Well, now, entertain any questions that you may have for uh, Dr. Button or Lenore. Uh, we have some microphones in the middle. If anyone has any questions for them they would like to ask, now is the time to do that. Hello. Can you hear me? My name is Bob Reidelberger with the Kiwanis Club of Moraga Valley, California. Uh, I'm just getting involved with this meeting, and uh, it's uh, I, uh, something we should take to heart. What I wondered is, is the role of Kiwanis only to raise money, or are we going to be helping to coordinate 
Are we going to have people on the spot to help UNICEF, et cetera? Did you hear the question, John? Yes, and both Lenore and I are looking to our left. <laughs> <laughs> I was afraid of that. <laughs> this is time for questions for John and Lenora. <laughs> <laughs> Let me answer it this way. Our primary role is to raise money to fill the gap to eliminate tetanus. And that's our goal is 110 million to raise that. Uh, and US fund of UNICEF is actually helping us to do that as well. Uh, but uh, our role is not to be in the field. Uh, what you see when you go to a field visit is how complicated and complex it is uh, to one, gain the trust uh, of the people that are there. Uh, I can share for you my, in my story going to Cambodia. Uh, we, were, we were actually asked to go into the homes of these people who live three hours drive from the closest pavement. And uh, a stranger like me invited into their home uh, shows the trust they have in UNICEF. Uh, and it takes time to build that relationship and it takes uh, time and commitment and logistics. And especially for these very remote areas, which is primarily what we're uh, involved with, um, it, it, uh, the logistics are very difficult. And it would be impossible for Kiwanis to be actually involved uh, on the ground. So the boots on the ground is UNICEF. Oh, we're, the boot, we're the boots on the ground to raise the money. Randy, if I could add something to that. Yes. The other thing that we need to do, and, and I guess I'll back that up by saying, one of my outrages is that every day we live with the misery inflicted upon the world's children and don't do very much about it. Eliminate is offering a chance to do that, and we can do that at home by raising the, uh, the public's awareness of this silent scandal that we call maternal and neonatal tetanus so that our leaders, our national leaders, express their outrage and mobilize our communities and our national community to do something about it. In Canada, we have the Canadian International Development Agency, and we are working hard to get them on board because uh, in IDD, they helped us immensely financially. And so we can do our bit at home, and that's to, to raise awareness of this silent scandal raise awareness, grow our Kiwanis clubs. By growing our Kiwanis clubs, we are helping those people in the Philippines and, and other countries. So there, there are things that we can do uh, and will we'll be doing. I mean, isn't uh, Kiwanis all about keeping families whole? Uh, and that, that is a big, big part of the connection uh, that we're about in this campaign. And so by doing that, uh, we're, we're, we're building and we're furthering uh, this campaign. Uh, well, other questions I, I was for thinking of the fact that uh, my company, for example, is heavily involved in the Philippines, and it would seem that you know there ought to be something we could do as Kiwanians or just as people to help UNICEF do this thing besides raising money. Well, and that's, and, 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 and that, that is, uh, again, that's, uh, I, please hear me. Uh, there is other things we can do besides raise money. That's grow your Kiwanis clubs. Tell your personal story. That's what this workshop is primarily about, is telling your personal story. And what we're trying to convey to you is uh, all of us don't need to be and cannot be uh, in these other countries, in these remote areas. Uh, but we can and we all do have a personal story and a connection that involves Kiwanis, that involves children, that involves families, and that is exactly the same story uh, that we're telling in, in these uh, remote areas as well. So uh, there are things to do. Uh, I know for myself, um, there's not enough hours in the day, uh, and, and I'm doing this in the United States of America uh, in my home uh, four, five, six hours every day on this campaign. So there are things to do, I can assure you. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Other, other, yes. Yes, my name is Joyce Garrow. I'm from the Kiwanis Club of Greater Parsippany in New Jersey. Speak and up, please. 
Um, I'm, my name is Joyce Garrow. I'm from the Kiwanis Club of Greater Parsippany in New Jersey. My question is uh, somewhat medical, I think, because in the U.S., we are, it is suggested that we repeat our tetanus vaccination mm -hmm. every 10 years. So we are saying let's, uh, let's immunize a young mother, a young woman, and three shots will do it for her life, it sounds like. And then the other question is, do we not have a combination vaccination for our children here in the U.S.? And is that what we're trying to also promote worldwide? Thank you. What happens after we immunize mothers and their babies are born? The babies have passive immunity for the first two months, after which time government mandated, UNICEF supported immunization programs take over. Three shots don't do it. And uh, what we do in Canada is we give tetanus vaccine at two months, four months, six months, and 18 months. And then at five years, 15 years, 25 years, and so on, every, every 10 years for life. Our primary goal here, uh, and Kate can tell me if I'm wrong, is to get tetanus vaccine, because I don't think we're giving combined vaccines, Kate, are we? No. Thank you. Dr. Khan? We'll, we'll get it to you. We'll get it to you. We'll get it to you. Tetanus diphtheria. For the time being, we are promoting strictly tetanus vaccine, but we are moving into combined vaccines, tetanus and diphtheria. The way it was explained to me was that the, 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 the campaign uh, and the solution that has been developed uh, by UNICEF and World Health Organization is three vaccines, the first two given within uh, weeks, and then the third one has to be uh, several months later. So needless to say, you got to go into these remote areas, you got to get these vaccines into these areas, these remote areas, uh, upon several occasions. And then that is only good for that mother for 10 years. Uh, and, and generally what I have heard is each and every one of us need a booster every 10 years. In fact, I had to have a booster to go to Cambodia. Uh, and I would say that probably most of you in this room are not immune at this point in time, you haven't had your booster. Uh, so that, that's another part of the story that you could build in uh, to your Kiwanis clubs uh, is our own self-immunization uh, as well. The 10-year period is also coincides with the average uh, um, childbearing age of, of female. And so therefore, that, that's kind of that period of time that they're, they're targeting in there. But needless to say, past the 10 years, if they're still in their, their child. But for example, I heard at MNT donor uh, workshop about, uh, you, you start thinking of all, well, why don't, you, why don't they just immunize uh, young children in school? Well, first is a lot of them don't have school, but those that do have school, if you immunize uh, a little girl at six years old, by the time she's 16, uh, she's not immunized anymore. Uh, and so you've, you've got those kind of medical issues. But uh, again, question, next question. Michelle Belton from Roanoke, Virginia, Board of Hi, Directors. Michelle. Hi. I, actually, I just want to make a comment as far as I'm going to, obviously, I, I met Dr. Button, and I'm enthusiastic about this project with my club. I'm our only delegate. I think one of the problems that we have with our club, we're 169 members, and I bet this is shared a, amongst a lot of the clubs. We tend to think of civic duties locally, mm -hmm. and part of why I joined Kiwanis three years ago was I, I was excited to be a part of an international organization that was as large, correct? I'm, I'm seeing a lot of people shaking your hands. Part of what I'm going to have a chore at doing with my own club is convincing them that we are affecting a worldwide candidacy here for an elimination project because we tend to think so small in our area, even with 169 members. So I think that we need to go home and educate our clubs that you're part of a much, much larger, larger entity in this. That's going to take a little bit to, to broad mind thinking, 
That's also what's going to help you with membership retention because us younger members want to be a part of something that's greater than our small towns and our small cities and our states and even our country. I'm excited about this project. Right. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you, crazy girl from Roanoke. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Randy, if I can add something there. Good. One, of the, one of the problems we experience in Canada when you're talking about garbage dumps and landfill is the, is the NIMBY attitude, not in my backyard. Sadly, in many Kiwanis clubs, one of their afflictions is the NAMBI uh, uh, disease. That's called not outside my backyard uh, when it comes to uh, service. We need to see the big picture. Um, the world isn't as little as it used to be. And our community is the world. One of the things that I can share with you, um, <coughs> Let me share a personal story. 17 years ago, Kiwanis International sent down a study group to ask whether or not we should do a worldwide service project. I was on that panel to ask the questions. And it was my opinion that we should not do a worldwide service project, that I joined Kiwanis because of my Kiwanis club and I was interested in serving the needs of my local community. Uh, needless to say, they didn't listen to me. Uh, several years later, uh, our district was joined into the IDD campaign, and I received a call from the governor at that time, Texas, Oklahoma, his name was Tommy Riggs, I'll never forget it, asking me to be the chairman of the IDD campaign in Texas, Oklahoma. Um, that was definitely not on my bucket list, uh, but I said yes. And fast forward, here I am today, chairman of a worldwide service project. So one, uh, don't take no for an answer. Uh, people can be and will be transformed through this campaign. And one of the things that, that uh, keeps coming back to me, every story I hear, uh, every time I go through a training, uh, every time I'm involved talking with someone is how favored I am that the birth of my children was healthy and how special a privilege that is. And it's that story that uh, can, will grow Kiwanis. I mean, we're already seeing it. We're already seeing members actually coming to this campaign. And it's not a far reach to explain to those 169 that if this story brings members into Kiwanis, are not those new hands, new money that can be used for your local community service projects? Mm -hmm. So it, it, it kind of works off of itself to, to do that. So I think one more, one more question or in the back. Yes. I'm Dottie Mann from Clarksville, Tennessee, member of Hilldale uh, Kiwanis Club in Clarksville. I, Lenore, I'm a mother of grand, grandmother of 10, so I heard you very clearly. Uh, I, my question is, I have a perception I want to just verify. It's my understanding that a lot of the funding or the funding that we will be uh, raising will go to establish these clinics to provide the uh, tetanus vaccinations. Will those clinics continue? Will they, will they remain in place to be there to, to revaccinate years later? Will, in other words, will they survive to provide health care in these uh, hard to reach areas around the world? I can tell you what I saw um, was one, our money is not going to establish clinics. Uh, our money is going to education and the vaccines themselves uh, and to uh, that, that first phase, if you will. Uh, however, what I did see in Cambodia is, and you can be assured, and this was what really, probably the number one thing that came to me from the Cambodia trip, I was assured that UNICEF's got a plan. Uh, and along with the World Health Organization, they have an agreement in Cambodia that Cambodia is establishing those clinics to go inside as a complement, as they are vaccinating uh, and as they are Im immunizing, 
Then they took us over, so this is the new clinic that's here that will continue this with these families ongoing, and it will be funded by the Cambodian government. So yes, that, that, is, that is part of the plan for sustainability, uh, and, it, and it will vary in country, uh, but uh, no question, our partner is, is very um, experienced and been around a long time, and uh, the, they, uh, even to the point of what is key about this five-year campaign that we're in, uh, the money must be right because the plan is, if we don't meet it in five years, then everything starts slipping. So the plan is very comprehensive uh, and there's commitments made and so it, and it all fits together, but they have all the pieces uh, fit together. We're, we're one thread in that, that, that pattern. I think I can do one more and then we've got a few other things we need to cover. Hi, Irene Chekovich from Cape Cod, Massachusetts. I'm trying to information gather so I can then bring this back to our whole mm -hmm. district and sell it. With the $110 million, is that just Kiwanis' commitment or are other partners um, participating in that as well? And secondly, is there going to be a place on the web where, where we'll be able to see exactly how far we are and exactly what that money is going towards? Okay, you want, um, the, the total number uh, for the virtual elimination is 240 million, uh, of which there is a 110 million gap. Uh, there, and there have been actually other M&T donors for years, 15, even as much as 20 years, I believe, that have been involved in this campaign. Um, and uh, right now, the, but the number starting a year ago was 240 million, of which they have 130, they being uh, other donor entities, have committed 130 uh, and um, uh, created the gap of 110. And our role is the 110, uh, is to raise the 110, and together that 240 will achieve the plan. Uh, the second question was whether there will be a place where we can actually see progress yes. over the, over yes. the next five one, years. One of the big tenets of this campaign, unlike IDD, is to uh, have communication and, and social media uh, included that will, on a regular real-time basis, show you the fruits of our efforts. Thank you. I'll make it fast if I may. I'm James White from Alexandria, Louisiana, and I'm a physician like Dr. Buttons. When I was a medical student in the early 60s, I saw a case of tetanus and it was so rare in the U.S. that everybody was told to go over there and see that case in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. We are now seeing in the United States, mm -hmm. a developed nation, more and more cases of tetanus because people are not getting immunized like they used to. Mm -hmm. And so the side benefit from this project is not only to help the under serve parts of the world, but we will raise awareness for the rest of the civilized world to get people to have their immunization. Mm -hmm. sure. That's point number one. Point number two, uh, someone asked about local community and people aren't concerned about the rest of the world. We get up at every meeting and we give the mission statement, Kiwanis is a global organization of volunteers dedicated to changing the world, one child, one community at a time. Now's the time to put your money where your mouth is. <laughs> I need to get my staff to go sign that man up. <laughs> we got a job for you. Thank you, thank you all for, for your, great, your great questions. Uh, there are some things that I, I would like to cover for you before you leave. There are several major strategic objectives that this campaign uh, will address not only the programmatic and fundraising goals, but also will benefit Kiwanis. We are intent about legacy value for Kiwanis. Most importantly, we want to help eliminate MNT. And in fact, I would be remiss if I don't, let me introduce to you our part, some of our partners down here in UNICEF. They're, they're here in the front row. Why don't you guys stand up and show who you are? Let's give them a hand for all they have done. They brought us this opportunity, and for that, we'll be forever grateful. Thank you. Uh, we're partnering with an absolutely amazing organization 
I wish you could share the experience that uh, I had when you drive up in that Jurassic Park looking white UNICEF vehicle and uh, they think the angels have come when it drives up uh, and it is absolutely amazing the reputation that they have across the world and by raising this hundred and ten million dollars uh, we will raise the profile of Qantas International it's already happening uh, we will forever be known as the organization that eliminated maternal neonatal tetanus thus through our success we can expect to see an increase in membership uh, we're already seeing this, as I shared with you before, uh, the Cape and, and the Cape Coral Club, who is now our first 100K club, uh, they are telling stories about how their membership is increasing. Uh, we're, we're seeing that, and you can hear about that if you'll come to our workshop on Saturday at 1030. Uh, we'll be talking about the more specific details of, of that part of the campaign. Uh, we're also uh, going to strengthen Kiwanis' giving culture and relationship between its members and the Kiwanis International Foundation. Uh, we're also, that will include strengthening culture of giving with the, the district foundations and strengthening culture of giving with club foundations. I saw when I was district chair of Texas, Oklahoma and IDD, our district foundation grew more than it ever had before during the IDD campaign. Our club foundation grew more than it ever did in any other time. So don't tell me it's an either or, it's not. And this is not an either or campaign. Uh, we, by introducing a giving culture uh, of which we Kiwanians are very generous, uh, we're, we're building uh, all of these other organizations that we have for further mission and service. <laughs> and finally, uh, there's nothing more powerful uh, for setting us up to achieve success in future as being successful in the present. Uh, thus, we want to be prepared for our next endeavor. One of the things that we encountered when it was, we were, went about selecting uh, this project, there were, were and continue to be many Kiwanians who are very upset that we didn't pick their project. One of the main reasons we didn't is because we didn't have the capacity to do it ourselves. Hopefully, in this five years, we will grow our capacity to where maybe that next one we can be at the boots on the ground somewhere doing whatever. But right now, we just unable to do that. So uh, this campaign is about reaching the world's poorest women and babies to eliminate this deadly disease. We have a tremendous opportunity, uh, but we also can, can build and add value to Kiwanis as well. So we, we hope you uh, will come back to the workshop tomorrow at 1030. Uh, you, will, you, you will hear Dr. Button's story again, but we have uh, a, another guest that will share with you a, a story, and I can just kind of, uh, her name is Carrie. She is a philanthropist. Uh, she has donated uh, $1 million to this campaign, uh, and she also had a, has a child who suffered from mater maternal neonatal tetanus. She adopted as a baby. Uh, and that child is here with her, now 16 years old, and uh, y your life will be changed if you come tomorrow and uh, hear that, that workshop. So we invite you back. Um, we have, we have uh, all in this room as Kiwanians been blessed to be a blessing. And so one, one of our immediate goals uh, you can be part of, and that's to consider while you're here at this convention, a personal gift. Uh, a few larger challenges that we have for you uh, would be to recruit model clubs and to identify 100K clubs. Uh, model clubs are clubs that have pledged to raise a, a, an exemplary per member average of $750 US by fundraising early and often. 100K clubs are defined as clubs that contribute $100,000 US over a five year period be thinking every one of these numbers that we talk about is over a five-year period. Uh, as I've mentioned, uh, we will hear from the first 100K club on Saturday uh, and a few of the model clubs on Saturday as well, a, a more nuts and bolts type uh, workshop there. And so by working together and all of these and learning from these, these workshops, we will together work uh, to eliminate MNT. Speaking of a personal gift, um, 
this is a personal opportunity for all of us. Uh, we all have an opportunity to help others right now. Uh, the time and the place is right now. It's not often we're given that opportunity to make this type of effect on the world, but now we have that, that opportunity. I know for me, uh, I'm personally connected to this campaign, and this is your chance to help others, and this is my chance to help others because others have, have helped me and, and touched me. Uh, everyone out there has a, work a worksheet. I uh, think the color it looks like this. Should have been, should have been in your chair. Um, every one of you has a story of your own. Whether it's a passion for global health like Dr. Button or a personal experience like Lenora or a commitment to keeping families whole or saving lives, strengthening Kiwanis or protecting your own mother, uh, your own children, we ask that you start today working on your story and consider telling others why you support the Eliminate Project. I want to thank you again. I think our time has run. Uh, there's just se ne never seems to be enough time, but uh, together, I know with your commitment of spending your time with us today, that uh, we will change the world again and change the course of humanity. And with our partnership with UNICEF, uh, we will provide hope to the poorest, hardest to reach families around the world. And look forward to the opportunity to work with you further. Uh, we have uh, staff and many volunteers in our organization uh, that we are continuing to build that will be resources for you. So I look forward to our continued success and to work on building each and every one of our personal stories. Thank you very much for coming.